And joining us this week at the Roundish Table, Dr Adam Lockyer, lecturer in US politics and foreign policy at the United States Study Centre at the University of Sydney. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Now, the fiscal cliff, we've been talking about it a bit this week. Jim Manley earlier, former advisor to Teddy Kennedy and Harry Reid, says this isn't just about avoiding tax Mageddon or whatever they're calling it, but also it could be a defining moment for Barack Obama's second term. Do you agree? Is there that much writing on it? Oh, that's right. So what we're really trying to get um, groups with is, well, what's going on with the Republican Party? Um, because if you think that for the last two years the paralysis in Congress has been a strategy just to make Obama a one-term president, and so what therefore they've said? been... Then they've just been obstructivist because they're trying to um, make him lose this election. Therefore, they should be more cooperative and we should be able to find a solution before the fiscal cliff. Unless they want to lose the next election for the Democrats as well. Uh, well, yes. Uh, <laughs> so, or you might just think that they've been obstructivist because of ideology, mm. uh, because they've all signed the Norquist pledge that they're never going to raise uh, taxes, that they're going to just vote down all raises in revenue. If you think that's what's been driving the paralysis in Congress, well, then you won't see any solution before for the fiscal cliff. Could we see a switcheroo and, and have Democrats say, well, not so fast, you know, we're, we're not prepared to reach across the aisle, you know, we've been there for the last two years, I mean, could, could they get difficult now? Oh, perhaps, because, I mean, many say that if the Democrats let um, the US economy go over the fiscal cliff on the 2nd of January, then the whole argument changes. Then all of a sudden the whole argument turns to, well, we're going to decrease taxes, and now we've got Democrats and Republicans working together to try to roll back the damage done by the, um, the expiry of the tax, uh, the, the tax cuts. Mm -hmm. One thing that has changed since the last time they went round a year and a bit ago, though, is Barack Obama. In that he, he at the time he was he was, he was trying to play conciliatory and mm -hmm. passive and let Congress do their thing, and he just took a huge bullet in the polls, went way, way, way down, and then he started to get aggressive towards the end. Clearly he's come out swinging from the beginning now. Mm -hmm. I guess he can afford to. He's already won his election, mm -hmm. and he saw that didn't work the last mm -hmm. time doing the passive thing. Do you think that will make any difference, or is it just down to Congress? Well, no, I mean, he wants to get a solution now. It's in mm -hmm. Barack Obama's interest to get a solution to these problems bef uh, before mm -hmm. or during the fiscal cliff period. Mm -hmm. If he kicks the can down the road for another six months, then the political dynamics uh, change, and therefore he has less leverage over Congress than he does at the moment. Mm. So right now he's got a ticking time bomb underneath Congress and he wants to use that for his full advantage. Mm. There, there, there's been a, this constant refrain in, in Obama's first four years that said that he wasn't assertive enough. He, mm -hmm. he, he wasn't giving enough direction to Congress. Mm -hmm. And yet, historically, Congress, if you, if you present them with a fait accompli like the Clintons did in 1994 with, with health care reform, they said, whoa, that's, that's just holding a gun at our head. You know, you, we, we, we have a, a part to play in this process as well. How do you strike that right balance? A president who, who leads yet consults and works with Congress? Oh, it's a difficult balance. And I think that... Um, Obama's natural instinct is to be conciliatory, to sort of get the Republicans and Democrats around the same table and say, well, what do we have in common? What interests do we share? Let's move forward on those in interests. And in this particular issue, what those interests are that they both share is they don't want taxes on the middle class and the poor. Uh, where they disagree is on that 2%. So those individuals earning more than $250,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Now, if they, if uh, Congress was to pass laws tomorrow, uh, Obama would sign those uh, straight away. Is it too cynical to say that sometimes Congress likes to be pushed around by the President because it gives them a certain amount of political cover and it's sort of like, well, you know, this is the best deal yeah. we could get. Yeah, I mean, and I think that uh, in this case, um, that's probably not going to be th what's happening here because what like I was saying it really comes down to well what cause do you think is driving the um, obstructivist policies of uh, strategy in Congress so if it is ideology then it really doesn't matter what Obama says whether he tries to push them around or try to be conciliatory they're going to just have their blinkers on we're not going to raise taxes no matter what and one thing we should probably shouldn't forget about this issue is that there's a whole bunch of unemployment benefits tied up in this issue that everyone forgets they were talking the tax cuts tax cuts tax cuts but there's a whole bunch of people who are about to get cut off from unemployment benefits in December, this, if something doesn't happen. Yeah, th well, this is uh, what happens mm. is that in, when we're talking about uh, you know, Bush-era tax cuts, mm. uh, they're, they add up to about $400 billion, but mm. it's a whole series of things. It's payroll mm. taxes, mm. it's uh, health care affordability, it's, um, it's, it's also just in terms of um, I income tax breaks as well. So it's a whole bunch of tax breaks mm -hmm. and it gets really complicated, which then sort of moves us forward to, well, they've only really got two weeks left. 
Next week is the Thanksgiving break. They come mm -hmm. back officially for two weeks in December. Um, can they um, sort of unpack all these uh, complicated um, tax and, and reforms within two weeks? And it's going to be a difficult task. A talking bit of overtime, I yeah, think. Yeah. Yeah. Talking about uh, complicated uh, foreign policy. Um, <laughs> we've been watching the Petraeus scandal for puns and jokes yeah. and front page laughs, etc. Let's get serious about this. Mm -hmm. This guy was a popular and competent head of the CIA. Mm -hmm. Him going, does it make actual any difference to foreign policy or the CIA, or is it, does the system just go on? Yeah, not, not really. So, I mean, it's, it involves um, both spies and espionage yeah. and a sex scandal. So this is always going to grab headlines and hold it for an extended period. But in terms of the strategic and political impacts, it's going to be pretty minimal. Okay. Strategically, um, Petraeus was made head of CIA uh, to better coordinate CIA's activities in Afghanistan. Mm. Um, and now they're winding down. So over 2013, um, US operations in Afghanistan are going to be winding down. So he would have sort of very quickly uh, outlived his usefulness and okay. if he hadn't already. Um, and in terms of the politics, um, Benghazi was always going to be a circus, mm. um, a political circus in Congress. And um, so this is going to add more wood to the fire, but overall it was always going to just be really theatrical and so this is going to add to that. Is, is this, uh, that circus you talk about, one of those being drawn into the three rings is Susan Rice, the yep. US ambassador to the United Nations, who was out there right after the Benghazi attacks mm -hmm. on the weekend talk shows in the United States saying this was a, this was a terrorist attack, this was about the, the, uh, the anti-Islamic films mm -hmm. and so on. That was the, the line at the time. Mm -hmm. Part of this is, of course, because she's on the short list, we understand, to replace Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State. So there are, there are potentially very high stakes here in terms of Obama's national security team. Um, yeah, so, I mean, getting um, confirmation into Secretary of State in particular is always a blood sport going mm -hmm. through Congress. So, and this is just getting revved up for that. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a warm-up. Um, mm -hmm. And so we see um, you know, John McCain coming out and attacking Susan Rice. But that's just warming up for what's about to come. The week just gone, we saw Hillary Clinton in Australia, Leon Panetta as well. Interesting timings. As Osmond was going on, former Prime Minister Paul Keating uh, made a speech, which had been scheduled months in advance, apparently, before that meeting had been scheduled. But he was essentially saying Australia is too close to the United States. We shouldn't be having Marines being posted in the Northern Territory. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to be careful about uh, being anybody's uh, deputy in, in, in the region. What do you make mm -hmm. of those comments and the timing too? Um, so I think that, well, the, the timing is probably co coincidental. Um, and I think that he's not completely wrong um, that Australia, of course, needs an independent foreign policy um, and needs to probably strike out a little bit more in the region and engage in particular with Indonesia. So we've been having these Osman conferences uh, since 1985 and we don't have anything similar with Indonesia, mm. um, which seems a bit strange. And so we can sort of take Paul Keating's um, views on that um, and I, I accept those. But is, um, our, is our relationship with America stopping us doing those things no, in not Indonesia? At all. No, no, not at all. Yeah. And I think that um, China's rise in particular has many countries in the region concerned. Mm. Um, so we talk about uh, the United States coming in to balance China. Mm. It doesn't need to. Um, all the states in the region are already starting to balance China, like South Korea, Japan, and even Indonesia and um, the Asian countries. Do, going, do we have a sense sort of... as to how we've been focusing on, on Beijing, but, but do we know how Jakarta feels about the fact there are a couple of thousand US Marines going to be on their doorstep? Um, they weren't so concerned about that. What they were concerned about was um, the, the potential to base UAVs, the, the drones, mm -hmm. on the Cocos Islands, because what they will be doing is flying off into the Malacca Straits and off into the South China Sea. So basically flying over Indonesian airspace the whole time. Right. And this is going to be um, sort of negatively impacting upon Indonesian sovereignty. Sounds and like uh, that was what they were really concerned about. All right, Adam Lockyer, great to talk to you. Thank you very much for joining us at the Roundish Table this week. And that exactly. is all the time we have for another edition of Planet well, not all. America. Really? We still have our awesome closing titles, John. All because people see them every week. Doesn't yeah. mean they're not great, fantastic closing titles. Don't forget the closing titles. They're great value. I, I, I love the closing I titles. I really so, don't. I don't think we've got time. I don't think we've got. To, we haven't got time for a prime. We have the closing titles next week. Next week.